On behalf of Friends of the Lost Coast and the Bureau of Land Management, King Range National Conservation Area, with support from the Conservation Lands Foundation and King Range Alliance, welcome to the second installment of Wildlife Conservation on the Lost Coast, a virtual lecture series. My name is Justin Krellin, Administrative Director with Friends of the Lost Coast, and tonight we host Dr. Don Goldie, Professor of Zoology at Cal Poly Humboldt, and her talk, Marine Mammal Research on the North Coast, Conservation and Community. Before we get started though, Friends of the Lost Coast acknowledge that the lands from which we present this series are the traditional unceded territory of the Sinkion and Matol peoples who have stewarded the land, water, plants, and animals from time immemorial with great respect for the interconnectedness of life and ecological knowledge that is foundational to the health and sustainability of the Lost Coast and its preservation for future generations. Now, please welcome Dr. Don Goley presenting Marine Mammal Research on the, North, on the North Coast, Conservation and Community. Thanks for joining us, Don, and please tell us a little more about yourself and your work before you get started. Take it away. Hello, everyone. I, I recognize a few names out there. Tice, I see you there, and, and others that I've come to know, Christina and Steve and Cheryl and others. It's great to see you all. Um, as you know, my name is Dr. Goley, Don Goley from Humboldt State. I've been here for since 1996 and I'm the marine biologist here. I've been um, honored to come to know this land and the people who have stewarded it since time immemorial, as well as the people who are, are engaged in amazing stewards now. And so it's my pleasure to talk to you about some of the work that we found and some of the things that we've done. I don't mind if your um, videos are on, if you wanna say howdy, I am gonna ask a couple questions in the middle of the lecture. So feel free to just chat. This is a group of people who care deeply about conservation and about this area. And so please, it's not a formal get together. It's just sitting around the fire chatting about uh, marine mammals and conservation. Um, thank you, Justin, for inviting me. It's an honor to be part of this series. And I really appreciate all that the Friends of the Lost Coast do for, um, for its community as well as for um, the nature that it, it helps to steward. So um, I will stop there. Is there any questions before we begin? Oh, hi, Andrew. <laughs> um, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Hopefully I can remember how to do these things. I'm going to um, share screen one, Let's see if I do this right. I'm gonna move us over here for a second. So yeah, please, if anybody has a question during the time, can you see my slides? Is that what you're seeing? Or you no, see we're seeing uh, your desktop right now. Okay, I will stop sharing. It's a pretty picture of Hawaii, but you don't need to see that. So I will um do this. Sorry. I tried to make it so I would. Okay. There we go. We even practiced, didn't we, Justin? We did. <laughs> Um, so as I was saying, feel free as we go along to um, put your hand up or jump in or jump out and because um, I really like to answer questions along the way if you have any. So share my screen again. Ta -da. How is that? Is that better? Yep. Okay, perfect. So um, today I want to talk about conservation and community and Justin was telling me that the theme of this um, series really is conservation successes and challenges um, and solutions. And so I'm going to give you a sort of brief overview of a few conservation um, projects that we're involved in and some of the solutions which involve some of you and community as a whole. And so um, tonight's talk is going to be focused on thinking about these long-term baseline monitoring programs and how they help us to learn more about animals, in my case, marine mammals, so that we can be more informed um, people that uh, are engaged in conservation of these groups. Um, the significance of community stewardship, this is something I believe in deeply, um, and it's not a community that I'm building, but communities that we bring together to for the common cause. I'll talk to you about one of the chapters will be on our elephant seal study out there. Another will be on the Marine Mammal Stranding Program. Um, and then hopefully the, I'll talk about a path ahead, which is a Harbor Seal One Health Program. And I will highlight the conservation components of those different programs. That sound good to you? Yes? <laughs> okay. Sounds great. 
Sounds good. Okay, so let me talk to you a little bit about the role that um, marine mammal natural history plays in conservation and the role that the natural history plays in um, our ability to study these animals and to inform these management processes or projects. So um, right now, these are critters that we study as part of our marine mammal program here. This is a gray whale. These are stellar sea lions, both of which happen to be um, long migrators. They migrate quite some distance. Um, they're very long lived. And this is the path of most gray whales. We do have study some gray whales that stay here along the California coast. And then this is the path of of elephant seals. And so they come here, up here around the Northern California coast, which I'll talk to you about our colony, but they disperse and they migrate out to the Aleutian Islands, the males typically do, and the females go out all the way out in the Eastern Pacific. And so I want you to think about, just to think about for a second, the role that being long-lived and migratory, what are those challenges to our ability to one, study them, and to two, sort of really um, inform conservation um, processes. Um, I also want you to think about um, how our habitat um, is a challenge for us to do the same thing. So when you think about the challenges of living on the North Coast for a marine mammal or along the North Coast, you have to think of it as being a super remote area, vast and rugged, inaccessible beaches, limited population areas, and it makes it challenging to observe marine mammals on land or at sea. And so how do we overcome those challenges so we can even get to know these marine mammals well enough, as I said, to inform um, conservation? These long-term baseline studies and conservation, these are the challenges facing the North Coast. So not only the marine mammals are kind of challenging to find, they're long-lived, they swim a long way away, um, but our coast makes it pretty challenging to gain access to them. And then there are other challenges that are facing the North Coast, which include climate change with the subsets of sea level rise, warming ocean, increasing terrestrial temperatures, um, and increasing frequency and ferocity of storms. And Justin and I were just talking, there's a fierce and, and frequent storm that's coming in tomorrow, I think. Um, as well as thinking about human impacts and not as much up here, but increased population size, increased pollution. These are things that are impacting the marine mammals as well. So how do we get a sort of detailed understanding of all that so that we can inform conservation. So this is a question I wanna ask you. So um, how might long-term studies, why would we have to use sort of long-term studies as the basis for understanding marine mammals and how can that aid in their conservation? Anybody wanna take a stab at that? Like why are long-term studies important for marine mammals and how are they gonna help us understand um, how to conserve these species? Any ideas? You can throw something in the chat if you'd like. Anybody? You're all so quiet. <laughs> well, part of the thing comes down to that long-term studies will enable you to gain access to animals that might rarely visit there or only visit there seasonally. And it gives you more of an opportunity to gain access to those animals over time. And that is going to be what is going to be the most important to inform management decisions. So long-term studies on the North Coast um, include a couple things, getting a baseline understanding, basically just who is here, right? And when are they here? Where are they? Why are they here? And that's kind of the before. So before anything goes on, we just need to have some basic understanding of what's happening here. And then from that understanding, we can see, did something change from what we expected, right? Because you have a baseline, which tells you what you're gonna expect. And then you can see, did something change, right? And that's kind of the, the meat of what we do with conservation. 
And then we can address specific biological or conservation concerns with targeted research, right? Oh my gosh, there's this spike in marine mammal strandings. What was happening there? How can we bring our resources to bear on that problem? So today I'm gonna to highlight two of these long-term research programs, our elephant seal work on the Lost Coast in your neck of the woods and marine mammal strandings. And I'm going to emphasize our community collaborations there, which includes many of you in the room today and friends of the Lost Coast. And then I'm gonna propose a new collaborative research effort in Northern California. So um, our approach to marine mammal science is based on building community. So we kind of walk the walk here. So I've been here again for some time and we've built a wonderful thriving undergraduate and graduate student community here in Humboldt that has been working towards addressing, building this baseline understanding of many marine mammal species along the coast. Um, we're super grateful to be welcomed into the community of tribal members and other community members to sort of learn from each other's understanding of these natural places and these animals and these places. So um, we're excited to join in these collaborative stewardship program projects, which I'll talk a little bit about today. We have lovely working relationships with state and national parks and CD, um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and BLM and other sort of government agencies that are again, charged with stewarding this land. Um, and then every single community member who has called in and chatted with us or asked us a question, this has really been an important component of our work. And so we are grateful to all of you for joining us in these stewardship efforts. So the majority of this work was started, as I mentioned, with our graduate student program and colleagues along the coast. And again, everything from stranding work to sort of um, offshore or nearshore work with seals, sea lions, and whales. So it's been a very active research program. Again, a lot of it has been to form this baseline understanding of what's normal in Northern California. So I want to talk to you about a couple conservation successes. Um, first, um, we have to know why these animals needed to be conserved. I'm sorry, my computer blinks out sometimes. Can you see it still? Yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah. Yes. That's okay, good. good. Thanks. So um, conservation success is northern elephant seals. Um, uh, they were hunted to near extinction in the 1800s, and there were less than 20 left in Mexican waters and in oceanic caves. And from that came another sort of rebound of this group with protections from Mexico and then protections from the U.S. So now there's over 1,500 um, 150,000, sorry, 150,000 um, elephant seals. And the most recent colony has now formed up here in Año Nuevo. So most of these animals were located down here in Mexico. And you see scattered different um, populations growing up and down the coast. And so I'm going to talk to you more about this conservation success of elephant seals as they found a lovely hollet up here along the Lost Coast Trail. So this is a newly established colony, established around 2015. It had the potential to grow super quickly, but there is a conflict, and this is where the conservation part comes in, right? There's a conflict with human recreational use, as well as there's a conflict, potential conflict, with climate change, right? So they're at the center of this. And given that it's a brand new colony, much of our work has been establishing these counts to see how that colony has grown and how it's growing. So our baseline understanding has been looking at the impacts of colony growth on recreational use as they come to enjoy the Lost Coast Trail, as, as we do, um, and thinking about the impacts of climate effects on, on um, colony growth as the land gets hotter and as the sea level comes up and as increased winter storms and king tides combine to wash away much of their habitat. And so I'll show you some slides in a little bit about the most recent event and show you some of the repercussions of this kind of um, climate issue. So all of this work has been done under a National Marine Fisheries Service permit. 
And I want to sort of emphasize that the pictures that you'll see were taken under this research permit and shouldn't be shared or um, copied. So first to understand is the natural history, right? We were talking about that earlier. So what is the natural history of elephant seals and how does that impact our one, ability to understand them and two, our ability to implement um, changes that will help to conserve the species. So at any time of the year, you can see an elephant seal on a colony. And these are the different age classes and sex classes. So the of subadult males, adult females, juveniles, and babies or pups and weanlings, animals that have just weaned. And these bars just represent when you can find them on the coast, when you can see them on land. And so subadult males, you can see during the breeding season, which is now, uh, and adult males. The molting season is in the middle of summer, and then they come back to breed in late, in early winter and stay throughout the year. Adult females come during the breeding season, they're there right now, and then they leave for a super short period of time and then come back to molt in April, May, June. The juveniles don't come during breeding season, right? They're not old enough to breed. They come during molting season in the spring and then they come back in the fall just to rest. So there's a bunch of juveniles, a bunch of young um, teenage elephant seals on the beaches around that time. And then the pups are born obviously during the breeding season and then they molt after their moms leave them. And so this is an example here of when you have the pups here, this is a pup that a really new pup that's been born and a mom, this is a, a, a a molting elephant seal. They molt all of their skin out and they look really, really sad during that time. And then this is post molt when everybody has a sort of shiny new coat. What this tells you is that we are able to go out to, this, to the colony and we go out every week and we're able to do counts and we're able to track the trajectory and the, um, uh, the health of this colony. Any questions, you guys? Are we good? Good? Okay. So what we do is we count seals. So we count them from the coast. This is one of my grad students, Emma. We take photos of them and then we um, establish who's been out there um, and how many there are at any given time. And then we tag and mark them. Over here is what we're spending a lot of time doing now. We mark them with Clairol hair dye. And from that hair dye, we can stand on the beach and, and identify these animals without having to go down to the beach. I see somebody in the chat. So is it correct to guess busiest on beach in January through March? Yeah, January through March is the biggest time for pups and um, and males, adult males and females. But honestly, the, the most animals you'll find is in the and in the springtime when both the juveniles are back and the adult females are back. Sometimes we have over 700 animals on the beach at that time. This is kind of the most energetic time, most dynamic, males and females. Males are chasing each other, females are giving birth, they're breeding, it's craziness. Um, but the other time is the most populated time. That's a good question. The other thing that we do is we tag our weaned seals and when we, because then we can identify when they come back and when they give birth and how the, and make estimates of how that colony is gonna grow based on that. And we also track the tags that other colonies have put on. So different colonies along the coast put on different color flipper tags. And then we can look at those tags and look at that number and check in with them and say, hey, we just saw your two-year-old male elephant seal. And they'll say, oh, it was born on this day. And so we are, I just got a call from Pedro Blancas all the way down south um, about a, a female here that had just given birth, one of our females that had just given birth down there. So it's exciting to sort of track them throughout time. Something else in the chat. Oh yeah, you're welcome, Andrew. Um, so those are the things that we do out there to keep track of these animals and to do counts that will help inform our conservation um, plans. Um, so the tag recites, this is the number of obs observed tagged individuals, and this is the different colors. Our king range animals have blue tags, the point rays animals have pink tags, the Año Nuevo animals have green tags, and the Pedros Blancas animals have white tags. 
So the vast majority now we're getting a lot more of our blue tags coming back because they have a lot of high site fidelity. In other words, they like to come back to where they were born. Um, but the other the ones that have moved away from their home colonies are mostly from Point Reyes. So the next colony down. And then the next most we see are the ones from the next colony down, which is on on Unuigo. And the fewest that we see are from Pedro Splunkus, which is the farthest away. So my grad student, Emma, is now looking into this to see how we can really understand and potentially model sort of the movement patterns of these seals. So here, I'm just showing you colony growth. Again, this is our baseline understanding. And this is just the last few years. We started this work in 2017. But from 2020 to 2021 is the red line. The yellow line is next year, et cetera. And this is this year, 2023 to 2024. And so you see that you have this period. This is just counting how many seals are on the colony, right? You have a big bump here in August when all the juveniles are coming to rest. You have a big bump here during the breeding season. And then you have a massive bump over here, which is when the molting is happening. And so what you're seeing here is that this year, the juvenile haulout had a higher number than we typically have. And I'll show you over here. And this is just, sorry, this isn't a very formal graph. It's just one we're using to keep track in house. But here you see, this is a graph of total number of seals of different age classes. And so breeding males is down here. How many breeding males do we typically have? Do we have last year? How many adult females? And this is from last year's breeding season. How many pups is this red line? And then how many weaned pups is here? And what you see here is that these are the numbers we've had in the last few weeks. So we see that our colony, the number of pups is growing significantly. So there's another question. Let's see, do local elephant seals move back and forth to other colonies? That's a great question, Mark. Um, we are tracking that right now. And, and it, the idea is that they will settle down within the first couple of years of where they're gonna be. The vast majority come back to where they were born. But during that first year, juveniles, particularly juvenile males, sometimes females, kind of can, can explore a little bit. And sometimes they end up in a different colony and um, but then after two or three years, they pretty much are settled about where they're going to be. So those pink tag females from Point Reyes, they'll come and they typically stick after they've left their colony. They'll typically stick and then they'll have babies there and then potentially their babies will do the same thing. So that's a really interesting idea about like how are these colonies growing and how is that all working? Um, so, yeah, so right now we have 215 pups or so. Um, and we are looking forward to seeing what the peak numbers are going to be. And we should get those, the peak numbers of pups on the colony should be next week. And you see that this colony, this, this number drops pretty quickly. And it drops pretty quickly because those pups turn into weaned pups, right? So after four or five weeks, the females leave, they go off to sea and they just leave their pup on the beach and say, good luck, see you later. And that pup has to sort of figure out what to do at that point. And so you have these piles of weaned pups that kind of congregate. They're super duper fat. And then they will kind of sink. <laughs> They'll kind of wither away a little bit and then decide it's time to go off to sea and then they go off. Super high mortality at that rate because they don't really know what they're doing. But um, after that year, after their first year, if they survive that, there's a fairly high um, success rate of those animals over time. So the summary of this is that we think that the King Range might be a climate refuge for elephant seals. And by that, I mean that farther south, when it's super hot on the beaches during the summertime and the springtime, it may be just too hot for those elephant seals. They may be starting to sort of head north and somehow they found this beach up here, which is pretty exciting. Um, our beach, doesn't have as has a lot of area to for elephant seals to expand into because there's lots of marine tears there the beaches are quite wide so there's a chance for this colony to expand quite well the only caveat is the lost coast trail happens to be going through the middle of it so we're working with blm to see what how we can help with that issue 
first example of a successful range expansion of species. And so this protected wilderness area has done exactly what protected wilderness areas do, right? It, it offers a safe and wonderful place for um, species to survive and to expand. It may serve as a colony, a seed colony for more northern expansion. And so these seals might be able to find the next colony in the next area along the coast that will make it easier for them to expand. And um, right now, we're seeing immigration from other colonies as the main driver of colony growth. But soon, maybe this year even, we're getting more and more females and males that were born here coming back and contributing to the population growth. So pretty soon we're gonna see a big jump as all of the blue tagged seals, the seals that were weaned here, come back and are reproductive. So we're currently mapping habitat use and predicting future habitat use as part of my grad student Ashley Jacobs work. And um, we're looking forward to doing that. So I wanted to show you a couple of interesting nature nuggets from this year. Um, this is a seal. You can see that it is a, a young seal. It has a head tag, which is a satellite head tag. It has a back tag, which is a radio tag. And this critter showed up on our colony. It's like, what is going on? Who is this animal? Well, obviously, we can look at the tag. And you'll see here, this is a blue tag. And that blue tag is actually an animal all the way from Vandenberg, um, Vandenberg Island, well down off of San Luis Obispo. So colleagues of ours were studying how juveniles move and what their success rate is, and they put these tags out, but then the tags stopped emitting and they didn't know where this animal was. And so I called up my friend at Slow and said, hey, I think one of your seals is up here. And they came and were able to retrieve this and be able to track the movement of this seal over many, many um, miles. We've had many high tides and big swells. This is just from last week when we were out there. Here's a male elephant seal laying fairly high up on the beach. And you see this series of swells come in, wash him over and wash out. I also witnessed moms and babies get washed over and washed out and came back together, which was wonderful. But these high tides and big swells really do have a significant impact on our coastline. So in general, understand that King Range is one of the most prolific or potentially prolific colonies along the Pacific coast. Thanks, Darcy. It is not the most prolific right now. Um, the Peters Blancus and Point Reyes have five to 10,000 animals down there. There's lots more animals here. Our maximum breeding number is gonna be probably around 300 this year. So we don't have as many. We are just the, mo the newest colony and we think that there's significant opportunity for them to expand. If they explore and find the mouth of the Matoll, I can imagine that that is going to be a beautiful area for them too. So it's not, um, it is the most, the newest ones, but not the old ones. Lurking predators offshore here, yeah. So there are, killer whales really do like um, elephant seals. I didn't show you a picture of this because it is close to dinner, but there was, one of the females on our colony has a massive shark bite out of her. We noticed her last two weeks ago, and then this week she gave birth to a pup. So she seems to be um, potentially able to have a successful um, reproductive event. And then we've had over 220 pups born so far on the colony, which is, um, like I showed you before, significantly higher than in the past. And you can see here, we even have some females that have two pups that um, that didn't give birth to two pups, but now are nursing two pups. Um, and that could potentially be um, adopting other pups or, or collecting pups that have been washed away from their moms. We're not exactly sure. But um, it's been an exciting year out on the colony. I was telling Justin before we came, the road's been washed out and we're crossing in chest waders. It's not an easy place to get to, not even necessarily a safe place to get to, but um, but we're pretty committed to sort of tracking the the success of this of this group. Um, we had our first wean pups last week. This is pup number one, and this is pup number two. They were without their moms, and you can see how fat and sassy they are. And so we've been able to sort of tag these animals so that when they go offshore and hopefully come back next year or the year after, we'll know when and where they were born. 
Any questions about elephant seals before I jump on to our next chapter? No? Yeah? I've got a question, Dawn. Yeah. Um, so when you showed that map earlier of the colonies, I don't maybe they're not colonies, but north of uh, of King Range, uh -huh. kind of Rock, Shell Island, and some spots up in Washington, yeah. are those considered uh, colonies? And uh, and if so, are those now considered the northernmost uh, elephant seal colony? This is still the northernmost elephant seal colony. Those others have very tiny populations, and so we have um, up here you were mentioning in Shell Island, et cetera, that they have five or 10 animals. Um, so they're really teeny tiny groups of, of pups and there's really not habitat to support more than that right now. So these are very unlikely right now to expand, but we keep looking along the coast um, to see where a more likely place would be. And so there are a couple beautiful be wide sandy beaches with intertidal places that are good for elephant seals, they just have to somehow trip upon that area. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, somebody else has something in the chat. Let's see. Will I get myself back? Concerns about genetic? Exactly, Mark. It's exactly the the problem. And so one of the conservation successes for elephant seals is that they have come back from 10 or 15 or the number kind of varies between estimates, but, and now there's 150,000 of them, but the reality is they are not very diverse because they're all coming from a very small seed population. And so one of the concerns for that, one of the conservation concerns for that is that any illness that would strike one or two could have a profound impact on the entire population because they don't have those, um, they don't have the diversity to sort of um, counter that. What do they eat, Susie? They eat um, deep sea critters. And so the way that, that elephant seals make a living is they get offshore and then they go deep. And they're deep divers, mile, mile and a half at a time, hour or more dives at a time. And they feed on deep sea squid and fish. And then they come to the surface, get a breath, and then just go straight back down and die. It's thought that that's possibly a, a predator avoidance behavior, right? Because sharks and killer whales are up here and they're down here. Sharks and killer whales can't make it down there. So it's kind of a safe place. And there's some good food down there. So that's what they go and feed on. Um, how do they use their elephant noses? Good question, Vanessa. The males have those big proboscis and um, they use them to um, vocalize or it helps them vocalize. So what they do is they'll throw their heads back. The adult males will throw their heads back. Their nose will kind of land in their mouth and it can be this kind of resonating chamber, very low rumbly sound. And that is a, it helps to have those acoustics work a little bit more effectively. Good questions, you guys. All right, I want to tell you about one of my other favorite things to think about um, is the Cal Poly Humble Marine Mammal Stranding Program. We started in 1997, but we've just started to do this effort-based monitoring, which means that every month you do the same stretch of beach. So you get to know what's normal along that stretch of beach. And we've been doing that for quite some time. We most recently expanded, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But for the longest time, we've been doing this just in Humboldt and kind of a little bit Del Norte County. Um, and that we've mostly done that with our, our Cal Poly Humboldt undergraduate interns and graduate students. But we've recently started these community hubs of which the Shelter Cove community is a part um, and also working with tribal partners and other community partners, as well as our other groups. We're associated with the vertebrate museum at Humboldt State. And so many of the animals that we find on the beaches, we're able to save the skull and skin and et cetera, so that we can sort of help educate students as they come through here so that they can become more informed um, stewards as well. So I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about what strand and marine mammals are. And I'll try to zip through this because I'm sorry, I'm running a little late. I'm chatting too much. Um, a strand and marine mammal is any whale or dolphin on the beach that's not supposed to be there. Obviously, a whale on a beach is not a good idea. But pinnipeds, seals, and sea lions can be on the beach. And, um, 
And if they're sick or injured or out of season or not supposed to be there, that's what we consider stranded. Marine mammals strand because of human interactions, because they're sick or starving, or normal ecological or oceanographic events. Such things as harmful algal blooms or El Nino events or heat waves or predators such as killer whales. This was a harbor seal that was seen in Trinidad by some of our students who was obviously the victim of a shark bite. And here is a little Guadalupe fur seal that was found entangled in fishing nets. And so we're trying to get an understanding for what is the cause of death of marine mammals along the coast and what are normal patterns in terms of season and timing. Human interaction and, and entanglements. Again, this is an animal from this year. It is something that that's, happens more frequently with um, nets that are left in the ocean. Um, we work with Cal Fish and Wildlife, as well as NOAA, to, uh, as part of the whale disentanglement team for whales that have been disentangled at sea. And we also are part of the, um, part of the stranding network that responds to dead whales on the beach. Oceanographic and environmental concerns. We are in the middle of an El Nino right now, which is a warming offshore climate. There have been a massive harmful algal bloom that happened down south this year that affected dolphins and seals and sea lions. Massive event down in the lower um, California area. And then we've most recently had um, a leptospirosis outbreak up here. And so this is what an El Nino does. An El Nino just brings a lot of warm water next to the coast. That warm water is not very nutrient rich, so animals tend to starve because there's not enough food for them to make it. So what we see with El Nino events is typically really um, emaciated animals coming ashore. We haven't really seen a lot of that yet, but I'm not so sure that we've um, we've dodged that bullet quite yet. Um, this was the last event was 2015, and we're looking to see how this most recent El Nino event is gonna affect marine mammal populations along the coast. We're part of the National Marine Mammal Stranding Health and Response Program. Um, we are responsible for all of Del Norte, Humboldt, and, Mo and half of um, Mendocino County. And um, we work closely with all of the other stranding networks to share our information so we can look for patterns of stranding along the coast. Our region responsibility, again, is up here. And many of you know, because we're already so excited to work with you, but um, we do respond to dead marine mammals. If you do see one on the beach, um, you can contact us directly at marinemammals at humble.edu, or this is our number. And if you're calling about a sick or injured marine mammal, we work closely with the North Coast Marine Mammal Center. You can call them too. So why do we care about marine mammals stranded? Marine mammals are indicators of ocean health. So if you're seeing animals that are dying on the beach, it's most likely because something's happening outside or on the out in the ocean. Um, they're a great indicator of human impacts. And those are things that we have some control over, right? We have control over the things that we're causing. Um, and it provides evidence to support management decisions. And so when you think about conservation, these walks and this information that we find on the beach gives evidence and data to make stronger um, conservation decisions. Question. Yes, didn't, yeah. Yes, anytime, especially Linden. My goodness, if you are walking Centerville Beach, that's one of the hot spots for, um, for marine mammal stranding. So please do contact us at marine mammals at humble.edu. We'd love to hear any reports from there for sure. Um, oh, just did that one. So our response includes responding to calls from public, like if Lyndon finds one the next time they're out on the beach that they would let us know and we would respond to that, but also these systematic carcass surveys. And as many of you know, we collect the same exact information on each and every carcass, and then we share that information with the National Marine Mammal Stranding Network. We also, again, are part of the Large Whale Entanglement Network, where we work with others to disentangle whales. So why do we do systematic efforts? It's the same thing we've been talking about, right? We're thinking about these long-term data. You standardize the effort so you can get a baseline understanding from which you can look at divergence from that standard. It gives us an early warning, especially up here where we're so remote, right? If you find one oiled animal or one um, 
injured or entangled animal, that can be the beginning of, a, of an event that um, if we hadn't seen it, we might not know until it was really far down the road. And so it gives us an early warning system for oil and wildlife and other events that are happening offshore. It helps us identify centers of stranding activity so that we can figure out what the problem is there and what's happening there. And it also supports a quick response, right? So for those of you in our team right now who are walking those beaches, if you found something, a, a stranded whale, you could say, I know where that whale is. It's on my beach. Come down and we'd be down in a second, right? So that, well, not a second, a couple hours, but um, that's kind of the idea, right? That we know the coast really well. And that's why it's been so important to work with local stewards because you know your coastline better than we do. So um, let me see, there's a note here. Oh, nice, nice, yeah. They're amazing. And then how much do they eat every day? The um, elephant seals? Are you asking, Vanessa? I'm not sure of the exact amount, but they eat pretty much all day. But I'm not sure how much exactly they eat every day. So I wanted to talk to you about a mortality event on our beaches this year, which you have all helped to document amazingly well. And it was a combination of leptospirosis, which is a bacterial infection, um, the oncoming El Nino, a warm water blob, which means that there's not much food out there, and then sea lions that have potentially been weakened from demoic acid down where they were before they came up here. So there was a number, massive um, event here that many of you documented with us. So I wanna show you what that looks like. So here's the total number of carcasses we found on the beach. Here's the observation month. And right here, this red line is what this year is like. So you can see that this has been a really unusual year, right? This is what we've been talking about. This is this baseline of understanding. And now you look at this year, 2023, and you go, whoa, something's going on there. Like something really different has happened. And so this is the time when we had that leptospirosis outbreak. And we were saying that it's a fairly overwhelming um, situation. And now this is, these are the data that show you the extent and the range of that group. So again, this is just the number of strandings we've had versus public reports of this red and then effort-based fines or the, this teal. And you could see that there were just a, many more strandings this year than we've had in the past. The vast majority of the strandings that we have is this blue color, is this California sea lion, the animal that strands the most seal and seal lion. The harbor seal is the second most stranded pinniped or seal or sea lion. And then the cetacean observations, we have the vast majority of the cetaceans or the whales and dolphins that strand are porpoises. And then we always have a few um, gray whales that strand. So we started with these three new stewardship hubs. And I just want to sort of give a huge shout out to this and tell you a little bit about them because it's not only been wonderful learning experience for me and my students to learn from you and from our tribal partners about the amazing nature of the beaches around us, um, but it's also been incredibly important for our understanding of strandings and in, in the research and the science that we do. So we have three different groups, the Talua Dene Nation up north, the Bear River Band and Matoll Restoration Council around the Matoll River, and then the Shelter Cove community, which includes the Friends of the Lost Coast and others. And so this green area is the humble student sort of area. And then our partners are really covering this other part of the world. And so I'll introduce you to them just quickly. We have the Talawa Dene Nation, and that has six segments, 30 kilometers worth of coast up around the Oregon border. This was a gray whale that stranded there that was um, able to be responded to by both the tribe and our program. The Bay River Band Matol Marine Mammal Monitoring Section is the other side of the Lost Coast Trail, the Petrolia community and the Matol and the Bay River Band. Um, and that was a group that has eight segments that cover 16 kilometers of coastline. And then finally, the Shelter Cove community, which covers segment, seven segments and 16 kilometers. And that includes a number of you, which includes the Shelter Cove community, um, Honeydew Community, BLM, Friends of the Lost Coast. And so from this, 
I just want to show you what impact you've had. And so again, this is a shared community between all sorts of tribal governments and, and state and local governments, as well as community members. And I just wanted to thank you again for all that you've done to sort of support this work and tell you how valuable it's been. So this is what we found. Community hubs just began starting to do their walks in the spring of 2023. And it, counts for over 23% of all of our observations came from these community hubs. So a quarter of what we know about marine mammal strandings came from our community hubs. And here's the Shelter Cove hub. Most of those have been found on effort-based finds because there's not a lot of people walking those beaches, right? Much of that has been found on, on effort-based walks. And the similar and a similar thing has been found in Mad on the Matol and up in um, Talawa. So I just wanted to show you like how significant your contributions have been and how it's helping us build a new baseline for areas that we didn't weren't able to cover before. Um, this is what we found here, 2023. This is the number of observations. And this is this green arrow is the Shelter Cove community here, as well as the Matol and the Talawa, as well as um, start state and national parks. Pretty exciting. I'm pretty excited about that. So um, the significance of community st stewardship, it helps us build a deeper understanding uh, and relationship with each other, as well as with the, with the habitat and the coastline. And if you'd like to join our community, if you're not already here, Justin, who introduced himself earlier, is the sort of community coordinator, and you can contact him, or you can contact um, us, and we'll point you in the right direction to work with Flora or with us or Melanie. So strength lies in community. We have local community members uh, and a number of tribes, and we're just so thrilled to be working on this larger conservation problem with you. And I'm so excited to see what we're going to find out in addition to what we've already learned this year. So I'm going to take the last two minutes, and I, I'm sorry, it's I know it's hard to sit on a Zoom for this long, but I appreciate you sticking it out with me. Um, just to talk about this new project. And I know in Shelter Cove, there's this beautiful little harbor seal colony that people are very concerned about and very interested in and have a lot of, um, um, and care a lot about. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this harbor seal program we're starting here. It's from this one health perspective. And, and the one health perspective is saying that you can't really study a single organism the health of a single organism without understanding the health of the environment and without understanding cultural health, right? And so we want to think about having human health, wildlife health, environmental health, and cultural health all kind of coming together. And our community hubs are perfect for that, right? It's really the our, our my whole philosophy <laughs> is based on that. And so what we're doing is we're developing a new collaborative project studying harbor seals from this perspective. And part of this came about in relation to the incoming wind energy and to the idea that some of the dams are coming down or have come down. And we wanna sort of look to see the whole health, the one health of those areas using harbor seals or working with harbor seals as, um, as indicators of, of, of marine health. And so we're excited about this project um, and I'll talk to you more about that another time, but I did wanna give you a couple of nature nuggets about harbor seals before we end. And so harbor seals are facing a number of issues. If you've ever been around harbor seals, which you do see them there, they're really skittish. They get spooked and they get disturbed really quickly, right? And so human interactions really do impact them. Climate change is affecting them as well as every other marine organism. Increased predation, and I want to talk to you about that quickly. A paper has recently come out about the impact of um, coyotes on harbor seals and that they are preying heavily upon them down south. And we have seen evidence of, of coyote predation on harbor seals here too. And I know some of you have seen harbor seals out on the colony. I mean, not harbor seals, but um, coyotes out on your walks or and so we know the coyotes are here. Right now, Knockwood, they're not really causing a huge impact, but we are gonna start tracking that to see what kind of impact they would have. So if you see coyotes out on, the, on your walks 
or if you see them out on the beaches, it'd be great to hear from you and know about that. And then wind energy, it may impact harbor seals. We would like to study that. We would like to see if the sort of development of the infrastructure of wind energy has any impact on harbor seals. And if so, how can we mitigate that to make sure that they can um, live in harmony with green energy and human development? So, okay, that's enough. If you're interested in moving forward, if you're interested in becoming part of this program down around Shelter Cove or around the Matoll or in Humboldt County, please give us a call, um, as well as please let us know if you see any critters that um, you find on the beach. We'd love to hear about them and record them so we can learn more about stranded marine mammals along the coast. And I wanted to thank you, um, everyone, for coming, and Justin again, and Friends of the Lost Coast for hosting such a great um, speaker series, and for inviting me to come and get to see you and check in with you today. So thanks, everyone, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks so much, Dawn. Um, yeah, we'd like to open this up for anybody who's interested to turn on your camera. Uh, we're also going to change the security setting to allow people to um, let's see to unmute themselves in case they have a question. And in the meantime, I I do. Um, uh, with the leptospirosis outbreak, I'm wondering yeah. if we have any data on local mortality as it relates to mortality that we saw in the larger California coast. Yeah, we have we are still trying to pull that together for the whole coast. And so most stranding programs have an idea about how many animals that have died. And now we're just trying to sort of go through and say this was likely a leptospirosis case because we didn't do diagnostics for all of the animals that died um, so that we could get the samples for leptospirosis on everyone here. Um, so that's the kind of next step to sort of take that, that mortality event and try to tease it apart, which ones were likely and which ones were confirmed leptospirosis. So we just don't have that information now, but we might have it in the in the coming months and I'll share it, it with you. It sounds Sorry. like it was pretty dramatic in other locales as well. Oh yes. Yes. I mean, that's what happened this year. We had a massive demoic acid sort of, um, event down South. And then up here, we had this massive leptospirosis. So they were, the pinniped populations were hit pretty hard this year, for sure. Gotcha. And then uh, another question I have is about the wind energy project locally. I mean, obviously that's, uh, there's a lot of data that needs to still be collected about how yeah. um, populations are affected by that. But I wonder, is that something that you and your team are consulting on as they work on this project locally? Yeah, we've been, I was at the Tribal Wind Energy Summit today, and we've been working and talking with all of the sort of um, stakeholders in that group and um, are here to share our expertise with them and, and hopefully propose some of these studies that would help us understand more about the impacts on marine mammals of wind energy and development. Thank you. You're it welcome. looks like we might have a question in the chat. Um... What spreads or carries leptospirosis? Mm. Leptospirosis is bacterial. It's thought that it can be spread. It's definitely spread with, between seals, um, but it is also can is a zoonotic disease, so it can be spread between organisms. Um, there's some idea that it can be um, transmitted to um, from dogs and things on the beach. If they have leptospirosis, they can spread it via urine into um, seals and sea lions and vice versa. And can right, it be shared like with carrion, you said? Um, can leptospirosis be transmitted to carrion feeders such as condors? I don't think so, Kemzet, but um, I would check on that again. But it's mostly a, it's mostly a mammalian, um, I, I believe it's mostly a mammalian um, disease. In long-term study of stellar sea lions in California, yes, you see there are. We've been studying stellar sea lions since 2012 with the National Marine Mammal Lab, and they have um, two colonies up here, one off of Crescent City, off of the Lighthouse, and then one off of Rogue Reef in Southern Oregon. So we've been working with them to study and track the numbers of animals, and we have some marked animals that we track over time, kind of like our elephant seals are tracked. Um, so we've been doing long-term studies on them as well. California sea lions, not as much. 
The California sea lions are studied heavily down south. That's where they breed in the Channel Islands area. And then they migrate up here during the winter time. And there's not a lot of work that's being done up here, partially because it's really hard to get out on the water at this time of year, as you can imagine. But um, most of the work is being done down south, except for the rehab and for the um, stranding work that we do up here. I don't know if we answered this question earlier, but uh, Vanessa asked, do you have public information posted regarding the stranded marine mammal program? I, assume I do have, trailheads. thanks Vanessa. I do have a, um, a website, but um, in terms of other public information, um, aside from the website, no. But um, I, we do have some signs posted at the beginning and end of the Lost Coast Trail. And we do have the trail stewards oftentimes share that information with people that are hiking on the trail. Um, at different trailheads, we do have, you know, if you find a sick or injured or dead marine mammal, please call us. But in terms of anything broader than that, that's all we have right now. Several uh, questions in the chat here. Uh, I'll just go to the top. Is lepto expected to get worse when we see climate warming patterns, or is that not considered a factor? Gosh, these are great questions, you guys. Um, it's not necessarily um, affected by um, temperature, water temperature, um, but it is cyclical in nature. And we're just trying to figure out what those cycles are. It used to be fairly predictable, as I recall, every four years or so. But um, we're just looking to see how to predict the next cycle of lepto coming um, around. And I i don't know the details about that, but I don't think it's associated with climate warming patterns. Um, and Lindsay, are you involved in the proposal to bridge the northern and southern sea otter populations? I am not involved in that proposal. I will tell you, Lynn, what I know about that in terms of um, we have found in the stranding network, we have found two dead sea otters in our surveys over the last 25 years. One was a subadult male that through the genetic analysis was from the Northern population. And one was a Southern, um, a southern juvenile male from, from the Southern population. And so we've had two Romer juvenile males that kind of ended up on our beaches, but that's as much as I know about them in our area for sure. And are surfers using the Lost Coast Beach with the elephant seals? That's a good question. I, I don't see surfers out there. It's kind of challenging to get out there. I think the place where surfers are is closer down to Sheltered Cove. Um, what's that big, big something? Big flat. big flat is where most of the surfers go down there, which is, you know, 15 or so miles um, south of that area. So no, not many surfers up there. Please put the website address in chat. Okay, we can do that. Um, maybe. Gosh, you guys are asking such great questions. Um, let me see. Anything else? Any other questions? There's another question. It's how disturbing is the Lost Coast Trail at this moment by passing so close to the colony? I have to tell you that is a that's a that's an issue, you guys. It's hard because the the Noah suggests that people stay 50 to 100 yards away from marine mammals. And if you saw in that picture that Justin posted, some right now the seals are on the trail. They're just laying there. And so it's really hard to do that. In some places, it's really constricted. So I always encourage hikers, and we talk to them every single time we're out there, to stay as far away as possible. Because especially at this time of year, the males are really dynamic and really alert and really aware and can move inc surprisingly fast, right? So they're surprisingly fast. So there are times when you're walking on the Lost Coast Trail and you don't even see that it's an elephant seal because they just kind of are laying there and it surprises people. So we always give the um, advice to always, if you're out there with a dog, always keep the dog on a leash, always keep it right next to you. And then to be alert as you're hiking. And if you see an emery mammal, stay as far away as possible. Never go down on the beach in that area ever. Don't ever go on the beach, but stay up on the trail and on the bluff to keep yourself and the seals as safe as possible. Sorry, I didn't mean to be all, all on my soapbox there. I just want to keep people safe because it's it's the more elephant seals that are out there, the more... Um, surprising that can be and if you're not going in prepared for that then you then you won't know to stay far away so keep your dogs close 
not only for leptospirosis, but for also to, to keep the elephant seals safe and then just stay as far away as you can there. I, I bet you've seen some pretty crazy public behavior at Punta Gorda too. Oh my goodness. Near the elephant seals, huh? Oh my goodness. You know, and, and it's not because people are mean or bad. It's just that they're just not informed, right? And so it's just up to us to sort of help them do the right thing. And I, I really do feel like people want to to sort of help animals as much as they can. They just sometimes don't understand. You know, you see on television shows, people going up and males are going like this and people are just getting right there and they don't realize that they could be squashed kind of in an instant. So so it's more education and just trusting that people want to do the right thing. Well, thanks so much, Dawn. Uh, any last questions? Now's your last chance. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be wrapping things up. Going once, going twice. Uh, well, I want to say just thank you, everyone. And please contact us, you know, even if you just want to hear about things. Thanks, Tice. It was good to see you out there. Um, and um, please stay in touch with us, mammals at humble.edu, if you have any questions or concerns or, or reports. Thanks, Dawn. On behalf of Friends of the Lost Coast and BLM King Range National Conservation Area, many thanks to Dr. Don Goley and Cal Polly Humboldt for the lecture this evening. We hope you found it educational and inspiring. Visit lostcoast.org or Facebook for more information on the larger wildlife conservation on the Lost Coast lecture series. And be sure to join us next Wednesday, February 7th, for part three in the series, Salmonid Monitoring in the Matoll River with Nathan Queener and Richard Sykes of Matoll Salmon Group. The series will then conclude on Tuesday, February 13, with Elk on the North Coast, research and management featuring Carrington Hilson, environmental scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Michaela Seichman Gunther, wildlife professor at Cal Poly Humboldt. All lectures start at 6 p.m. and are presented via Zoom. Thanks again for tuning in tonight, and to learn more about Friends of the Lost Coast or to make a donation to support our work, including programs like this lecture series, please visit our website at lostcoast.org or find us on Venmo. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. Enjoy the rest of your evening and all the best from Friends of the Lost Coast. Thanks again, Dawn. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, all. -bye. Bye,